right. And is it uh, permissible for me to share my screen for PowerPoint? Okay, thank you. All righty. So as was already said, the presentation that I'm going to be discussing today is called A Moment of Respite, How Virtual Learning Welcome Disabled Learners and How Academia Has Now Abandoned Them. So um, just some points of consideration that I'm going to be uh, covering throughout this presentation. Uh, one, I wanna ask how did disabled, chronically ill and neurodivergent students feel about being offered virtual classes during the pandemic? Are traditional in-person classes typically welcoming, comfortable, or accessible for these same groups of students? And how can academic institutions make things more welcoming moving forward now that things are shifting once again? All right, and briefly, uh, before I get too deep into things, I wanna just cover what do I mean when I say accessible? So in general, a space is considered accessible when students of different ability levels, body types, energy levels, et cetera, can comfortably and reasonably access a space. In this case, since we're discussing classes, this is in reference to how accessible a learning space is. An instructor who does not consider accessibility may inadvertently create a course or space that unfairly prioritizes some groups of students over others. So for example, if, um, a classroom space, right? If there's no wheelchair ramp um, to whatever building it is, obviously that means that that classroom in the most basic sense is not accessible to a wheelchair user. And that would be one of the most, I think, um, apparent discussed um, or obvious uh, examples that is discussed when we talk about accessibility, especially in regards to disabled students. But um, I will cover other examples of different sorts. So this is a question that um, sort of gets brought up a lot, um, particularly by people that maybe they're not super involved in disability studies, particularly in the United States, but people tend to assume that the United States um, government sort of protects a student's, uh, disabled student's right to education. However, that's actually not particularly true. So this quote covers um, this in depth. Uh, I do apologize that it's quite a longer quote. Um, so it reads, although the United States statutorily establishes public education for all students, education isn't considered a fundamental right under the United States Constitution. Instead, education seems to be treated as a service rather than a right. This standard allows separate, unequal, and different educational opportunities for students with disabilities. Although the United States has passed federal, state, and local laws in attempts to protect students from discrimination, these laws are not synonymous with developing every student's potential. This is because racial or gender discrimination receives stricter levels of review than disability discrimination. As a result, Equal education for disabled students drastically varies by region, time period, and forum. So the majority of um, my research and this presentation is in regards to the United States. However, um, several of the topics also touch on elements of other uh, basically English-speaking countries and education and accessibility there. Um, in the paper that this presentation is based off of, I also talk about Australia, Canada, et cetera, because there are many studies that sort of group all those countries together. And in the United States, certainly um, education isn't guaranteed to disabled students. In uh, many regions of Canada, basically the same thing applies because a lot of the laws that have been um, placed there are not actually enforced. So you get sort of a similar uh, situation there as well. So first, when we're talking about accessibility, one of the major things that people tend to think about is space and setting, which of course is more applicable to in-person classes that we would consider traditional. So things that could apply that would make a classroom that is in-person either accessible or inaccessible would include temperature, for example. Uh, this is one people don't usually think about, but it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to have a temperature in a physical classroom space that would suit everyone. You may get someone who, for example, has um, arthritis, uh, 
you may have someone who is uh, pregnant or going through menopause. There are many different conditions, disabilities, or chronic illnesses that could affect someone's uh, sensitivity to temperature. So for that reason, it's very difficult when you do have an in-person class to have the temperature well-suited to everyone. Also in relation to in-person classes, uh, classrooms typically place a single disabled desk near the front of a space. So this is especially true in uh, higher education. So universities, colleges in Canada and the US. Um, what will happen is if you um, request or need a disabled desk, which tends to be a little bit, um, you know, a bigger desk, maybe a more comfortable chair, um, maybe a chair that can be moved separate from the desk, not attached as some desks are, especially in the United States and universities. However, it's always near the front of the classroom and it's sometimes quite far off to the side. So this is probably not ideal for disabled students who may want that space if they are very socially anxious or especially if it is far to one side and that happens to be the opposite side of the classroom from the professor, which it typically is, uh, they may have difficulty hearing or seeing the professor in that particular case. So there are many reasons why having only one space where a disabled desk might be is not necessarily ideal in a physical classroom space. Um, so next, chairs with attached arms are good for some, but not all. So as an example, if a chair has attached arms, a person that, for example, has POTS um, or other um, illnesses, uh, chronic illnesses or disabilities that may affect their stability or strength or coordination, the arms would help them to stand up and sit down. However, for people who are um, fat or possibly have a false leg or certain conditions with their hip, having a chair with arms is actually not ideal. And traditionally in most classrooms, um, no matter where you go, you only have one type of chair because of course for the academic institution in question, it is cheaper to just mass buy uh, one style of chair. Uh, but of course, it's not necessarily accessible for everyone. Um, chairs may be placed too closely together or too far apart. So this can be an issue for wheelchair users, um, people that have other mobility impairments or need a cane or a walker, et cetera, if they cannot fit their wheelchair or their walker uh, through uh, in between a space of different chairs, then obviously that can be a problem. And then lighting may be too bright, harsh, or flicker. This can be an issue for people with chronic migraines or uh, optical conditions, visual issues such as aniridia, other conditions like that. It can trigger pain or migraines. And typically classrooms, at least in North America, do have very bright uh, fluorescent lighting. All right, so what, what are other elements of um, in-person classrooms that can be less accessible, but that we don't think about as much. So sound and fragrance are great examples of things that most people wouldn't automatically consider and are typically actually not accommodated for, at least in North America. Um, so for example, students with chronic migraines, auditory processing disorders, and more may be pained or overstimulated by an excess of sound. Limiting the use of sound, especially unexpected jarring sounds, can be beneficial. So for example, um, some professors uh, may like to play movies or play music for their classes. Of course, there's nothing wrong with that, but just the um, noise level can be an issue perhaps for these students or can cause discomfort. Um, second, students with allergies, breathing difficulties, chronic migraines, and more can become ill or distracted by fragrances. This includes not only perfume and cologne, but also subtler fragrances. So for example, um, lotion, shampoo, et cetera. Having students agree to voluntarily abstain from using fragrances or scented products can be helpful to these sensitive groups. So I have seen this brought up multiple times in um, disability rights and disability studies where uh, and a dis uh, disability studies researcher or an activist will suggest uh, that professors or academic institutions ask students if they will voluntarily consider not wearing perfume or cologne to class, not using strongly scented products. However, although I have seen that suggested often, I personally have never experienced this. Um, so it's very curious. I was unable to even find doing research uh, for this paper and project 
uh, any examples really of professors doing this. It seems to be quite rare. Uh, there were maybe two or three examples of people mentioning it in passing, but I was unable to find um, you know, really good studies talking about uh, large groups of educators that were doing this. So it seems that fragrance especially is something that is not really considered when we think about what makes a classroom accessible or not. Um, and this is just an example that it's not always students that are, you know, um, obviously, you know, telling you that they are chronically ill, disabled, et cetera, that might benefit from some changes to in-person learning if we are specifically talking about traditional in-person classes. So some of these issues are actually more universal than you might think and might actually benefit a large uh, amount of people. So this quote here is in reference to specifically these sensitivities to fragrances. So this quote reads, emissions and exposures from fragranced consumer products such as air fresheners and cleaning supplies have been associated with health problems and societal impacts. This study investigates effects of fragrance consumer products on the general population of four countries, the US, Australia, UK, and Sweden. Nationally represented population surveys found that across all four countries, 32.2% of adults report fragrance sensitivity, that is adverse health effects from fragrance consumer products. So we see here that in these particular four countries, that's almost a third of the general population. So um, that is something quite um, significant. It's quite a significant amount of the population. Uh, so it is surprising that in academia, this isn't something that is considered uh, more frequently for in-person learning. Um, next, just briefly, I want to talk about the topic of requesting accommodations. So for those who may or may not be familiar, because I understand the practices are different in different places, um, in many places, including the U.S., and certain regions of Canada and Australia. Traditionally, if a student needs accommodations, they will go to either, uh, usually it's called a disabled student services department or student services department of that academic institution. And they will specifically request to have whatever it is accommodated for them. So for example, if they find that the chair um, in the room is not comfortable for them, they will request that a different chair be brought in. Um, and typically this process involves many steps. Uh, typically you would have to go to a doctor or medical provider and receive a detailed note about your condition or what accommodation you might need. And then you would have to take that back to the department. The department would have to approve it. And in certain cases, especially in the United States, you typically also have the professor uh, approve it, or you would have to bring some copy of that information to the professor as well. Um, and this can be an issue for multiple reasons that aren't um, perhaps uh, too obvious. First, in the United States, especially um, where healthcare is not necessarily free or affordable for everyone, uh, where you may not be in a good area with like healthcare infrastructure, it may be difficult or expensive for you to get that doctor's note or get those records. Um, sometimes you have to go out of your way. Um, you may almost certainly have to go and pay a fee. And then of course you have to worry about um, actually making that doctor's appointment, right? So let's say you go to your first day of class, you find that something doesn't work for you. If you want to request accommodations, it may be impossible in order to request a doctor's appointment, get a copy of all that information before your next class. So you may be going to your next class and finding that it's still not accessible, or you may not be able to attend your second session of class because you still don't have that doctor's note and that classroom isn't accessible to you, for example. So I do have a quote in regards to the difficulty of requesting um, accommodations and some disabled or chronically ill students' feelings about virtual versus in-person and having to request accommodations in person. So this quote reads, as the pandemic drags on, we repeatedly hear the lament, I wish things were normal. It's an understandable plea for the return of maskless socializing with friends, hugging relatives, and for those of us who teach and learn to return to the classroom. But as my colleague, Carolyn Henze Gonzala, or Gongola said to me, excuse me, some of us really don't want things to go back to normal because they never worked for us in the first place. And in this specific quote, in this specific article, um, they do continue on to describe how requesting those accommodations essentially cause you to already go out of your way, pay additional money 
uh, feel othered, have to sort of discuss your disability or illness, which may feel a little bit personal with maybe multiple people in the student services department and possibly the professor who may not have any sort of uh, typically, especially in the U.S., any sort of training about um, catering to disabled or chronically ill students, so that can be uncomfortable for them. All right, and also one thing to consider is often when we talk about disabled and chronically ill students in in-person versus virtual learning, uh, neurodivergent students get left out. However, typically uh, disability studies does include neurodivergent students in a lot of their research and in a lot of their commentaries on the topic. Um, so there are multiple studies that discuss these issues, and I will say that there are some studies that find that for some neurodivergent students, um, they also found that they um, enjoyed the virtual learning better than the in-person learning because it was accessible to them in a different sort of way. So this quote reads, one student with Asperger's and ADHD noted that moving to online assessments meant that it was much easier to work in a place of their choice over a long period of time. Another student with ADHD reflected on the fact that they were able to select when to start their time-based assessments within a given window, which lowered their stress levels, allowed for better planning of time and breaks, and helped them concentrate more fully on the assessment. So also accessibility is something we wanna consider specifically with neurodivergent students. So um, that's also something that should be a topic of focus when we talk about leaving virtual learning that they may have preferred and going back to in-person or traditional learning. Um, I will say overall, um, just as disabled students typically aren't catered to in a classroom, they have to go out of their way to request accommodations, the classrooms aren't already sort of set up with universal learning in mind. Um, the same typically applies to neurodivergent students in academia, meaning that academia doesn't typically set itself up for neurodivergent students, it sort of uh, makes neurodivergent students go out of their way to be included rather than coming up with a universal um, design for learning or applying UDL, for example. Um, so this specific quote discusses how neurodivergent individuals are typically uh, sort of uh, left out in academia and what sort of uh, social effects that can have. So this quote reads, atypical brain structure and functioning are quantitatively and qualitatively relevant to a variety of systems, which not only affects individuals, but also democracy as a whole. Millions of adolescents diagnosed with a wide range of neurodiverse conditions, ranging from neurodeve neurodevelopmental disorders to learning disabilities will transition into adulthood over the next decade, which significantly impacts healthcare and social systems. And um, I couldn't fit more, unfortunately. I didn't want to overwhelm with uh, quotes from this particular article, but I will have the work site at the end and this particular article is quite good in discussing how um, typically these social um, security systems, these healthcare systems tend to be overwhelmed with um, neurodivergent individuals who academia has failed and how a lot of them actually also end up in jail and prison, especially in the United States. So there are some um, big effects, especially to neurodivergent students being left out of academia that unfortunately is a little bit beyond the scope of this presentation in full. So the question is, is virtual the best option for everyone? Everything that I've obviously discussed before seems to point towards disabled, chronically ill, and neurodivergent students preferring virtual options because for disabled and chronically ill neuro neurodivergent students, they don't have to worry about an in-person space being accessible. They don't have to worry about temperature, fragrance, chair, desk, et cetera, because obviously if you're learning virtually, you're learning in a space that you can possibly have set up uh, for you for your day-to-day -day living. So it's more catered towards you, obviously. However, I will say that um, in my research, I found that it's not necessarily true that all disabled, you know, all neurodivergent students prefer virtual. The majority seem to, uh, in most cases, especially of disabled students, but not all. So I have a few quotes attesting to 
um, some individuals or groups who may actually want to go back to in-person. Um, so the first one refers to children on the autism spectrum disorder. It reads during the COVID-19 pandemic suggests that many children showed an increased frequency of behavioral challenges, higher anxiety, and poor emotional emotion regulation and decreased social communication skills. So for people on the autism spectrum or students on the autism spectrum, it seems that the majority actually would prefer to go back to in-person learning. So that's one group of neurodivergent students who um, on the whole seem to prefer the traditional in-person learning. And then we have another quote here that's related to specifically disabled learners. Um, so John Scott, a product manager for Blackboard Ally, says that analysis of 500 U.S. colleges by the learning management system provider found that more than 50% of PDFs in courses have accessibility issues. This troubling trend came at a time when PDFs were uploaded to courses at almost twice the rate as spring 2019. So for students who may have trouble with PDFs, uh, especially students that have certain um, visual processing disorders or trouble um, seeing, reading, etc. Um, it's PDFs that are not accessible, um, where you maybe do not have different font options, where you maybe do not have a reader option, um, can be troubling for them. So for those particular students, obviously, in person would most likely be preferable. Oh, sorry, I went to one too far. All right. And I did want to sort of give a few specifics in regards to um, sort of inaccessible PDFs. And I wanted to discuss uh, reading and visual items in general, because they tend to affect a lot of people with um, uh, difficulties with learning, neurodivergent students, and also disabled or chronically ill students. Um, and there's obviously a large visual element when we're talking about online courses, uh, where we're talking about using Canvas or using Blackboard, using these different um, softwares or websites for students, and where we're also, again, talking about PDFs. So some things to consider when we're thinking about accessibility visually in regards to reading. Uh, very small print may be difficult for some that have um, generally uh, various visual issues. Uh, dyslexic individuals may struggle with certain fonts, including Papyrus, Cooper Hewitt, Agency, any condensed font. And dyslexic individuals also, as well as those with various visual processing issues, may have trouble with justified text, um, which is generally considered um, more difficult to process and read without skipping lines, et cetera. Uh, furthermore, color is something that um, is typically not considered so much. Um, I do understand that certain uh, software, certain websites such as Canvas do try and optimize for color and visibility by mainly using black and white. Um, although this can still be an issue for PDFs that are sort of a dark gray or websites that professors create themselves, etc. So um, some color combinations may be difficult to discern for certain groups such as uh, red, pink, um, it causes trouble for those with deuteranopia or protonopia, uh, red on pink or green on blue and vice versa is not good for those with tritonopia and colors of similar tone or shade levels uh, might be unclear to those with monochromacy, which is essentially complete uh, color blindness. Um, and these are all issues that in most uh, schools and institutions, especially those that um, I was looking at my research, um, are, these are not things that are really typically taught to professors. A professor may or may not be aware of them, so they may or may not know to really institute this in their, in their classes when they're creating online content. So is there a solution? Um, it seems that you know, out of everything I've said, it seems that a lot of disabled and chronically ill students have a lot to worry about with in-person classes. Uh, there may be costs involved in the United States uh, with the healthcare system that we have. Um, it may be difficult for them to feel comfortable, especially when we're dealing with things like sound and fragrance, which are things that are almost never regulated, or even temperature, which may be theoretically impossible to regulate. But as we covered, there can also be issues online with PDF accessibility, or for students that are um, on the autism spectrum, they may prefer the structure of the in-person learning. So what kind of solution can exist for us? 
Um, so the answer is a fully supportive shift to hybrid learning in theory. Hybrid learning would offer the comfort and convenience of virtual learning for disabled students who find that in-person classes are sort of troublesome, uncomfortable, et cetera, while simultaneously providing the structure that some students require. Unfortunately, the assumptive readiness with which many in academia are returning to in-person only learning leaves many disabled, chronically ill, and neurodivergent students without the freedom to decide which might work for them. So typically in a lot of the conversations that um, I've seen and that I found in my research, um, teachers, instructors, and professors, and others in academia tend to be focusing simply on um, things like uh, grades, things like class participation, which of course are important. Uh, that's not to say they're not, but I rarely see uh, disabled or chronically ill or neurodivergent students discussed unless it is specifically in a um, in a piece of writing that someone that is involved in disability studies has put forward. So this is clearly not something that perhaps um, all educators or most uh, educators or people in academia are considering. And I do acknowledge that the majority of this presentation and the paper that is based off of uh, addresses primarily America and Canada with some consideration for countries such as Australia, the UK, and Sweden. So I do recognize that this may or may not uh, be, you know, more or less applicable to other countries, which may perhaps have better support systems for their disabled chronic ill and neurodivergent students. And these are my works cited. Um, I have two pages of work cited and I will say especially that the first piece here in the different font, the skin, tooth and bone, the basis of our movement is our people, a disability justice primer. Um, I would really recommend for any educator, person, academia, professor, et cetera, that is looking for some good suggestions on how to make their course more accessible as it is a document that discusses um, or contains, excuse me, lots of suggestions for making things accessible for all types of people. And these are just sort of the last bit of my work cited. And that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.